Well, I have a very embarrassing fact to share with you about myself this morning, and a little bit of advice at the same time. Uh, I am directionally challenged, which means I get lost very easily. So don't ever follow me anywhere. Um, one time we were going to Lushoto, which we do almost every Christmas. This was a few years back, and we got to the last roundabout, and we went the wrong way. And it took us about an hour of going the wrong way before we realized that we were going the wrong way. And the family behind us, we had to tell, we have to go all the way back and go the other way. Uh, Amy and I were talking about this and trying to count how many times we've done this in our life. It was more than we could count. Um, I remember one time we were going to Moshi and we were on our way to Oringa, two hours in before we realized we were going the wrong way. So we add another four hours to our very long car ride. So don't ever follow me is the advice. Uh, it's kind of unmanly to admit that you get lost easily. Like That's a manly thing. You don't admit you get lost. Um, and I think actually Google Maps has probably saved our marriage because we have a lot less fights in the car thanks to Google leading us to tell us where to go. Um, have you ever been lost before? Being lost is not fun, but the worst part about being lost is when you don't even realize you're lost. And if you're a guy, maybe you don't want to ask for help. You don't want to admit that you're lost and ask for help. When it comes to spiritual issues, I think that is one of the core problems that we find in the world and even in the church today, that people are spiritually lost and some don't know it, some don't want to hear it, and that's the tough question we're handling today. Some people would go as far to say as, you know what, as long as I believe I'm going the right way, as long as I believe I'm not lost, then I'm not lost. Some would say, you know what, you might think I'm lost right now, but in the end, all roads will lead to the same place. And there's a lot of well-meaning people out there that are saying these kinds of things that make us question how can there only be one way to God? And I want us to really think about the significance of that because it impacts every part of our understanding of the Bible, of the gospel, and our life in Christ. And Jesus faced this question many times, but in probably one of the most popular, well-known passages of Scripture, he spells it out as clearly as he can. And he answers this question, right? How can there only be one way to God? Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 3. This is probably one of the most well-known, most memorized passages of Scripture. But the irony is that a lot of people, when they read this, they miss the main idea of this passage. We, we treat verse 16 as this inspiring, beautiful verse, but we miss the context of what Jesus was really saying. The truth claim that Jesus was making and what it would have meant to the hearer. So as we look at this passage, I hope that you can put yourself into the perspective of Nicodemus. Imagine you are Nicodemus when you read this story as we go through it this morning. Let's look at chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do the signs you do unless God is with him. Now, there's some context here. It tells us a couple of things about who Nicodemus is. He's a Pharisee, and he's a ruler. For those of us who are familiar with the Bible, we know that a Pharisee was one of the most, if not the most, religious person 
in the community. Right? These were the pastors. These were the ministry leaders. These were the people that devoted their lives to studying scripture and doing ministry. They were very religious people. But then that other phrase that he was a ruler of the Jews. What that means is that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was a council of religious leaders, 71 religious leaders, the top, the most important, the most significant leaders in the entire country. And Nicodemus was in that council. He had gone to the right schools. He had devoted the last 40, 50 years of his life to studying the scriptures, to knowing these truths, and leading the people. So he is a very important person. And culturally, we understand when there is somebody very important, somebody that has a lot of weight, somebody who people say, wow, do you know who that is? There is respect given. There is honor given. You, you don't question somebody like that. Nicodemus, his entire life has been like that. He's been the top. He's been the one, when he speaks, everyone else is quiet. When he makes a decision, everyone listens. And he comes to Jesus, and it's interesting that John records that he comes at night. We don't know why he comes at night for sure, but Bible scholars like to speculate that maybe it was because he didn't want the crowds of people to see him coming. He didn't want the crowd to think that the religious leaders were giving Jesus more credit than was due him. Or possibly, he's coming on his own and he doesn't want his religious friends to find out that he's coming. We don't know why he came at night. But he comes and he brings great words to Jesus. Right? Verse 2, Rabbi. He starts off calling Jesus teacher. Now, this is, again, the most respected important religious leader in the country. And then there's this new guy, Jesus. Right? This is the first year of his ministry. He's only begun to do miracles and begun to teach. And they've heard rumors about this guy. They've seen him do miracles at the first Passover. But they know he has none of the same education. He's from the bush. right? He hasn't gone through any of the proper schools. He's not part of this council. He's not even a Pharisee. And he's definitely not a rabbi. But Nicodemus shows him some respect. Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. There's a little insult in there because he's not claiming to be a teacher. He's claiming to be the Messiah. But he says, we know that you're a teacher because no one can do the miracles that you do. So he brings flattery. Here is this important person. Usually when important people flatter you, you feel like, wow, if this guy is saying this about me, I feel really good about myself. And yeah, let's work together. I imagine when Nicodemus was playing this conversation over in his mind, yeah, you know what? When we had that conversation with John the Baptist, we kind of got off on the wrong foot. Right? We came to him asking questions, and he called us a bunch of snakes. And he warned us that we were going to go to hell. So let me come with a little flattery, okay, a little respect, and let's just see if I can figure out what this Jesus is all about. What is Jesus' response? And again, I think we miss the slap in the face, the insult that verse 3 is. Jesus answered to him and said, truly, truly, this is a very true statement. I can't make a more true statement than this. I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, we're familiar with this expression of being born again. But this is the equivalent of Jesus looking at Nicodemus in the eyes and saying, you know what? You're not going to heaven. You're not saved. That's it. It's there. No greeting. No mutual respect. No, oh, I know who you are, Nicodemus. Thank you for coming. I appreciate. No, just direct. You are not going to heaven. You are not in the kingdom. And for Nicodemus to hear this, 
I think this is one of the greatest insults in Scripture. Okay? Except for maybe Matthew 23, that's pretty harsh too. But no one has ever spoken to Nicodemus this way, has ever questioned his spiritual standing before God. Right? According to the Jewish teaching of that day, all Jews were God's people. All Jews were going to the kingdom. And the Pharisees were going to be in front. The Pharisees were going to get the best spots. They were going to get the most honor, the most glory, the most recognition. And now this boy, right, Jesus is just a young man, 30. Nicodemus is probably, what, 50, 60. This young boy from the bush with no education looks at him and says, you know what? You're not saved. I imagine, I would love to have seen Nicodemus' facial expression. I imagine he came in all flattery and smiles, and then Jesus speaks, and it's like, are you talking to me? Like, do you know who I am? C can you see my special clothing? And, and I think he was just utterly shocked that Jesus would talk to him in this way. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb. Now, Bible scholars are split about this. Some think that Nicodemus was confused, like, born again, I have to be physically reborn? How does that work exactly? Okay? And that's possible that Nicodemus was confused by Jesus' picture. Others think that as was the tradition of that day that rabbis and teachers often discussed in metaphor, in picture, and that Nicodemus knew exactly what Jesus was saying. And his question is more like, are you serious? Like, are you telling me that I would have to give up my entire life, the last 50 years of everything I've devoted myself to, and start over? That's what you're telling me to do? I suppose we can't know for sure. But Jesus' response is clear. Verse 5. Listen, Nicodemus, let me make this really, really clear. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. Let me spell it out for you, Nicodemus. Unless you have a spiritual rebirth, you have no hope. I don't care what title you have. I don't care what school you went to. I don't care how many years of ministry you have behind you. Unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus gives some imagery about this. And then verse 9, and this is why I think Nicodemus did understand what Jesus was saying. Because his next question was, how can these things be? Not what do you mean? I'm not understanding what you're saying here. He says, how can these things be? I don't understand how what you're saying can be true. I've never heard this before. I've devoted my entire life to knowing the Bible, and what you're saying makes no sense. How can there be only one way, your way, to God? Jesus insults him again. Verse 10, are you the teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? I, I thought you had a master's degree, Nicodemus. I thought you spent the last 50 years of your life studying the scripture, but you don't know the first thing? That is another slap in the face. Jesus is being as direct and clear. You must be born again. You must have spiritual rebirth, Nicodemus, or you have no chance. Jesus can't make it any more clear. When Sheshi brought up these different questions that we were going, going to be going through, he sent Mark and I an email about the message that Mark did last week on how we can trust the Bible and this one. And I was glad when Mark chose that one because he had the harder one. There's, there's a, a lot of ways to answer that question. Right? I could have got up in 30 seconds to finish my sermon. How do we know that this is the only way? Because Jesus says so. Pray, go home, 
have lunch early. Right? It, it's pretty simple. Jesus says he is the only way. So he is. Right? And this isn't the only passage that he says it in. John 14, 6. We're familiar with this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, not even Nicodemus, not even the most religious person that you can think of, no one comes to the Father except through me. There's only one road. If you're not on that road, you're lost. There's only one way. Jesus makes it as clear as he can. Acts 4.12 The disciples speaking about Jesus. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which they must be saved. It's only through Jesus. There's no other way. There's no other road. There's no other possibility. It's sad to me that as clear as Jesus makes it, that there are still so many people in the world and even in the church today that miss this idea, right? This verse, let's go down to verse 16, the verse that we know. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And we memorize that verse, and that verse is the heart of the gospel, right? That is is the way, that is the understanding, that is the truth. And it sounds so loving, and it is so loving. But he doesn't stop there. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, yet, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He, you Nicodemus, who do not believe have been judged already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment. That light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light. For their deeds were evil. Again, Nicodemus is just getting it hard from Jesus. I mean, this is like, I don't know if you've ever been in those situations where you see like somebody getting lit into by somebody else, like somebody just getting verbally assaulted by somebody, and you're like, this is awkward. Like, man, what did that husband do, right? The wife is just laying into him, and you're like, I'm just gonna go over here, okay? Nicodemus is really glad he came at night, okay? Because if there was a crowd around I imagine that he would have just been in utter shame and just been like, uh, he hardly gets a word in edgewise. You can count the number of words in this conversation, about 20. He gets a few questions in. He comes with this greeting, all smiles, hey Jesus, let's, let's see what we can do. And then Jesus just lays into him. And Nicodemus is like, uh, how? What happened? This is not how I pictured this conversation going. And the interesting thing about the story, we look at verse 16, we memorize verse 16, is the way the story ends. It just kind of ends abruptly, right? Look, he he stops speaking, verse 21, but he who practices the truth comes to the light so his deeds may be manifested as have been being brought by God. After these things, it it just ends. (laughs) It doesn't tell us what happens. My imagination What I think happened is after this last insult, this last slap in the face verbally by Jesus, Nicodemus was like, whatever. (laughs) I didn't come here to be talked to you like that. If you knew who I was, and you will find out, you'll regret that, right? I'm coming for you. I got a council. You're one guy, buddy, and some fishermen, okay? It's on. Like, in my mind, right, when big people get insulted... When important people get insulted, that's the response. Like, you have no idea who you're messing with. And I think that's probably what Nicodemus, I think he just storms off. He's like, forget it. I'm out of here. But I also imagine that later that night as he's trying to sleep, he's told his wife he's vented, 
about this awful conversation and the way that he was grossly insulted. But then as he's trying to sleep, the words of Jesus are just playing in his mind. And he's just like, how could he say, is that true? I don't love the dark. How dare, does he? And he's just wrestling with it. And it's interesting that we don't see Nicodemus again until about a year later where he kind of stands up for Jesus at one of these council meetings. They're wanting to judge him. He says, well, don't we first hear him out at least? And they speak him down. You go see if there anyone from Galilee can be a prophet. And he's like, okay, relax. I was just making a suggestion, guys. Okay, don't shoot the messenger. And then we see him again three years later from this point. After Jesus has died, him and another guy called Joseph of Arimathea, secret believers, they go to Pilate and they say, can we have the body of Jesus to be? It's not Jesus' mother, it's not his family, it's not the disciples, it's these two secret believers that go and say, we want to give him a proper burial. I believe we'll see Nicodemus in heaven. I believe that not at this point, not in John 3, he wasn't ready yet. This was a, a shocking truth. But given time and the power of the Spirit and the power of Jesus' words, that life came into him. And he said, I don't care what my friends will say, right? Taking that body and burying it was political suicide. That's the end of his career, probably the end of his marriage. His wife's not on board. He's got to move houses. He's got nothing when they find out at their next meeting. They're like, hey, we heard something crazy. Did you bury the body of the guy that we killed? Did you bury him? And he's out. He's done. But he doesn't care. Why? Because he believes verse 16. He believes that there is only one way. And that one way is to be born again, to believe in Jesus alone. It's interesting today, right? This tough question is not really a tough question in some ways. It's tough. It's not tough because the answer is simple. Jesus says there's only one way. The Bible says there's only one way. So there's only one way if we believe the Bible. But the tough part is, in the world, they will criticize this. They will say, you can't make that kind of truth statement. That is arrogant for you to say that your way is the right way, that your answer is the right answer and mine is wrong. And you know what? They're right. Jesus spoke the truth. Now, he didn't necessarily do it in an arrogant way, but he's saying, this is the only way. There is no other way. You can be as religious as you want. Nicodemus, you can spend the next 20 years, 100 years, doing religious things, and it's still not going to save you. It's still not enough. Some would say, this is very mean. This is very hurtful. This is very judgmental to tell people you're not going to heaven. You don't have a relationship with God. That sounds harsh. And again, I would say Jesus was a little harsh. Right? Jesus had to be direct. If he had just come and said, you know what? You're good. We're good. Okay. Nicodemus isn't going to heaven. He thinks he is. He's lost and he doesn't know it until Jesus slaps him in the face and says, you have to go the right way. You're lost and you don't know it. The woman at the well, okay, he has to expose her sin. He has to show her her need that she is lost and she needs living water. Do we believe that? Or are we afraid of the truth? Are we afraid of doing what Jesus did here and saying this is the truth? And I would say a lot of people in the church are. Statistically, we don't have good stats necessarily here in Tanzania, but in America, 70% of, Christ or 70 of Americans believe all roads will lead to God. 70% of Americans believe that. And in the Christian church, 56% believe that. So in your average American church, half of them believe, you know what, as long as you're a good person, 
as long as you try your hardest, as long as you believe deeply about God, as long as you do some good, I think you're still going to make it there. That's not the way I'm going. I'm taking this way, but we'll meet there in the end. And that's not what Jesus is saying here. Right? I was going to share with you a historical person. I was going to give you the name of this person who lived a very spiritual, religious life, devoted their entire, like Nicodemus, devoted their entire life to serving God. It's considered to be one of the most humanitarian people ever. And I was going to read some quotes from this person. And this person believed that all roads lead to God. They claimed to be a Christian, but they said, you know what, if you're a Hindu, I want you to be a better Hindu. If you're a Buddhist, I want you to be a better Buddhist. Whatever you are, it's okay. I just want you to follow that way. And that's enough. That is not what Jesus is saying. And if that person believed that, the day they died, if that person did not believe that Jesus was the only way, I'm not going to see that person in heaven. Right? Just like I wouldn't have seen Nicodemus in heaven if he hadn't changed. I grew up believing, going to church as a, as a youth, as a child, going into my youth, believing that my good works would save me. I don't know if I would have said it like that, but I thought that. That as long as I went to church, as long as I did the right things, as long as I ticked all the boxes, I was saved. And it wasn't until I encountered the true gospel that says, there's only one way. There is no other way. That it finally, like Nicodemus, it clicked. And it radically changed my life. Because I believed you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. There is only one way. Now it's interesting that the logic that people use against Christianity, we don't use for other things, right? In math class, when the teacher says, this is the answer, you don't say, well, that's the answer for you, but my answer is also right, okay? That doesn't work, okay? If you're lost on the road, and you stop for directions, and they say, yeah, if you go that way, you'll make it. Oh, can I also, oh, you can go that way too. Whatever way you want, okay? Those are not good directions. That's when you roll up the window and you're like, this guy's crazy. Let's go over there, okay? That doesn't help. Or when you go to the doctor and the doctor says, you know what? I'd rather be more loving than harsh. So even though you have this really terrible disease, I'm just going to tell you that actually you're okay. You're okay. You're good. Eventually you'll turn out all right, maybe. Maybe. But I'm going to tell you the loving thing. I'm going to tell you that you're healthy. Is that loving? No. It might be harsh to hear that you have something that can kill you. But then you offer the cure. Then you say, but there's a way out. Right? You're, you're not hopeless. So we don't want our doctors to be just loving and not give us the truth. Now, we hope they do it in a sympathetic way. We hope that they are compassionate and gracious when they tell us hard news. But we want them to tell us the truth no matter how hard it is to hear. And when it comes to the gospel, it has to be the same way. We have to speak the truth no matter how hard it is. I have a lot of family members. My mom's side is all Catholic. Okay? And it's hard because a lot of them just think, I grew up Catholic, I don't even go to church now, but yeah, I think I'm going to heaven. And it, it's hard to have these conversations where you feel like, I don't want to create problems, I don't want to create conflict, I just leave well enough alone. That is not love. So yes, it is hard, but it is necessary. Some people, when you say this, they would say, you're being judgmental. Christians are always, who are you to judge me and say that my religion, my way is not the right way? Who gave you the right to judge? And they'll say, even in your Bible it says not to judge, and here you are judging. Okay? A misrepresentation of Matthew chapter 7. Okay? Read the context. That's not what Jesus is saying, because in that same chapter, he says, judge the false teachers. 
By their fruit, you will know them. By the way they live their lives, judge and see if they are true or not true. So when he says don't judge, what he's saying is don't judge the way these false teachers judge. Don't judge in a hypocritical way where you have this great sin and you're pointing out the small sin, right? The plank and the speck. So yes, we are to judge. We're not the ultimate judge. We don't decide who goes there. But our goal is to help people find the right path. And there's only one path. Let's look at one last passage this morning. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. I call this the scariest verse in the Bible for religious people. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. This is towards the end of Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount. He's talked about the narrow road and few who find it. And he's talked about the broad road, the wide road to destruction, and many are on it. And then in verse 21, he says this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many, not a few, not one or two, but many will say to me on that day, on judgment day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. There are lots of people in church today, this morning, in the world that aren't going to heaven. Because they believe that by going to church, they believe by doing the right thing, that saves them. And the truth is, there are a lot of people in ministry who aren't going to be saved if they don't believe the simple truth that there is one way and it's through Jesus Christ alone. That's it. Nothing else. Faith alone in Jesus is what he's teaching. So what does this mean practically for us? So hopefully as we answer this question, Of how can there only be one way to God? The answer is simple, because Jesus says so. But also, for us to believe this truth daily. I I think I'm kind of like a recovering Pharisee. I started out that way, and then there's still this tendency inside of me to kind of think, you know what? You're a Bible teacher. That's like pushing you up there, you know? You're like missionary. That's like first in line kind of stuff. And I start to think that things that I do affect my salvation. And that's false. There will be missionaries, there will be Bible teachers in hell. Jesus said so, Matthew 7. There will be pastors in hell. Because they didn't believe the truth that you must be born again to get to heaven. So there are some people undoubtedly in this room, if you grew up religious... And you just think doing the religious thing is enough. I spent 18 years of my life believing that. And you're here today and you, maybe this is ringing a bell. You think your religion saves you. It doesn't. You must be born again. And it should impact the way that we do ministry. Right? We should model ourselves after Jesus. We need to share the truth in love. We need to call truth, truth, but we do it lovingly. Jesus was known as a friend of sinners and tax collectors. They wanted to hang out with Jesus. People don't want to hang out with judgmental people. Okay, so he was able to judge them and yet love them in a way they still wanted to be with him. Can you share in love? Can you be compassionate and yet still speak the truth? I'm thankful that Nicodemus eventually came to the understanding that there's only one way. But you have neighbors, you have friends in church, you have family members who haven't understood that truth. 
and they need to. We need to. There is, as we sang, there is no other name. It is the greatest name. It's the only name in terms of being saved. Let's pray. Father God, you are good. And you do love us with an amazing love that you would send your son. Christ would have died in vain if there was some other way to be saved. We know that you are the only way, the truth, and the life. I pray that we would passionately believe that and that we would lovingly, carefully, truthfully share this message with the lost world around us. There are many that are lost that don't know it. Help us to lead them to truth, to lead them to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.